the picture of the two houses. And this is very easy to see. In other words, this is a natural house run by solar power. And this is a techno house run by fuel. And uh, I really want to make this where this fuel is very much bigger than this. <laughs> There's more sun than there is oil. But the quality of it is so low that the natural ecosystems run on a much lower scale than this thing here. And so, so what we need, you see, is service. This is a parasite and this is a host. And we learn from nature that if a parasite won't survive, it doesn't kill its host. And so we have so many adaptations that people don't realize where the parasite and the host co-evolve, that's a good evolutionary process, to coexist. Now, some parasites do kill their host, but they're always parasites that have more than one host. But we only got one host, the earth. And so if we kill the earth, we're dead. <laughs> and we could do that very easily. And so the, the uh, parasite-host uh, analogy, I think, is a good one to keep in mind. Now, that's, that's not to belittle our civilization, or belittle cities to say they're parasitic. That's just to be uh, realistic. That's the truth. And we don't, we don't like to, to think of us as parasites, but we are. Every city depends on thousands of miles of countryside for clean air and water. All the food, no food hardly is grown in cities. Now, maybe in the future we'll grow a lot of food on rooftops. We could do that. Uh, we could, we'd have gardens. We could have cities run, ringed with agriculture. And a small farmer could uh, make a pay comeback and this is what again the agriculture people don't understand this till we talk to them about it and that is that a small farmer can can survive if his crop has a higher unit value so in Holland's a good example if you go to Holland you know Holland's biggest export is flowers that's their big that's what they run the country on you go any florist here and you may not realize it but all those flowers are grown in Holland Okay, so growing flowers, small, a small farmer can grow flowers in a greenhouse on an acre or two of land. See, but he can't grow soybeans or field crops. He has to have, what, 5,000 acres of land and so on. And so uh, we need to promote high unit value crops. Um, vegetables, another one, and particularly organic grown vegetables, which grow, make a big price. Farmers could raise organic vegetables on 10 acres, tomatoes and so on. And we down here in the south, we are dumb not to take advantage of all the sun we have. We have sun all like today, all the year round. All we need is a little protection against the occasional cold spells. So all we need is some plastic greenhouse. If you fly over southern France or go to the Channel Islands off uh, uh, England, they're covered with little, you fly in there and they're covered with little greenhouses. All the f vegetables from France are grown in the southern part, and all the beans and tomatoes for, New for England are grown in the Channel Islands, where they have more sun than they do in the main island. And so, and then the, here's the people who can make a living with a small amount of land. So, so you see, here, here's where the human aspect and the, 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 the partial solution to the horrible problem of all the rural people rushing to the city, which is not ready for them and they're not educated for them. There will be a generation or two before they can possibly be integrated. And so we have the cities that are getting to be one of the worst places to live. <laughs> and people move out. When they get enough money, they move out to the city as fast as they can, hoping to find some places as quiet. So have, okay, so, so then our final, of course, conclusion to all this is that we have a term called reward feedback. How many ecologists at this lecture series have ever heard of reward feedback? I know what it is. No, it's something that you learn from nature. In other words, reward feedback is a coevolution for coexistence among herbivores and plants and parasites and hosts. And so we must develop more of this for the biosphere humanity interactions. Uh, for instance, uh, example of reward feedback is discovered um, 10 years or so ago. We had a person here, Mel Dyer, who has written a lot on that and done a lot of work here on that. And that is when grazing animals, say buffaloes or deer or even cattle, 
when they graze grass, there is a growth hormone in this lava, which stimulates the grass to grow. So you can they can chop off the grass, and then the roots are stimulated to put up more grass. And so the grazer actually benefits. Hero, it rewards his food source of host. Of course, we do that with cop crops. We not only want to eat the crops, but we want to be sure they don't go extinct. And so we need to do this with nature in general. You see, is reward uh, nature for their services. And one way to do that, we mentioned today Herman Daly, and that is we have to get the uh, natural services into the economy. In other words, we have to value and pay for the services of nature. And one way to do this is what I call dual capitalism. In other words, you, you have a capitalism that, that has equal, gives equal value to the non-market goods as it does to the market goods. Present time, we only value and pay money for things that are made by people. We don't pay any money for all the work that's made by nature. And uh, there are various ways uh, <coughs> to, uh, of course, to do this and various things that Daly and my brother will speak about. Okay, so uh, we have both people that always ask us, are you optimistic about the future? And sometimes Daly said this to me when he was here. Somebody said, Dr. Daly, uh, are you optimistic about the future? And he says, not particularly, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> so I think uh, the bottom line for all of this is that until the public is well enough informed, educated, to realize that this next century, this century, is going to be, uh, have some very serious environmental problems. And my latest little essay is uh, just talking about is called Y21E. And the, the idea here is very simple, is that Y2K didn't cause much trouble. And people say, well, you know, that was a mis miscalculation. But what it really the reason it didn't cause much trouble because we spent a lot of time and a lot of money, you know, a lot of time and a lot of money uh, preventing problems. If we spend as much time and money on the environment as we spend on preventing computer tie-ups, we, we, we would solve a lot of problems. So I think what we ought to be talking about now is Y21, 21st century, year 21st, E, E being the environment. In other words, the environmental networks uh, can be messed up worse than any computer networks uh, by what we're doing. And the solutions, some of them are there, but people are not aware of them, are not yet ready. They're so, in, so excited about getting rich, some of us. And many of us are excited about being so poor. We <laughs> have this uh, dangerous gap increase. Uh, <laughs> and so so uh, we hope then maybe maybe we can get something like Y21K okay, as a as a rallying crowd. And the difference between that and, y and Y2K is that this Y2K involved mostly technicians. It's the technologists that worked hard and spent money to be sure that we didn't have breakdown in all this communication network. But the Y2E uh, will require attention of everybody. We have to all be involved. So this is a mission, you might say, for the new millennium that's, that, that we can't leave just to the technicians. We can't leave to just technology. Technology will help, but technology will not solve these problems. There has to be some fundamental changes in the way we think, in the way we operate. And so... Uh, and